be reading from Acts 10, 47. Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Be seated. It is a joy to once again say welcome to our worship service. We are glad that you're here. If you are a guest, we want you to know that you're honored right here. We want to honor you. We are very pleased to have you as a guest. If you have one of those uh, attendance cards that you filled out from that visitor's packet, please pass it to inside aisle. Be picked up at this time. We have started a new sermon series called Hey! That's not in the Bible. We're looking at common concepts, ideas, beliefs that people have that are not actually found in the Bible. For example, in the religious world today, many teach that salvation comes through faith only. Just believe on the Lord. Pray the sinner's prayer, and you have now salvation. You're now a Christian. This lesson today will examine why they overlook the command for baptism. Many of your five, when I say your five, I'm talking about people that you love who are not Christians. Many of your five believe in faith only. Guess what, folks? Your five are not stupid. They are religiously misguided by wrong assumptions and false teaching. For this lesson of the day, I'm looking at the top 12 passages that people say teach faith only salvation. In fact, I wanted to pinpoint it. I wanted to look at one man One man that approximately 40-something years ago, I had high hopes for because I had a friend of mine who was not a Christian. He comes to me and he holds up a book. He says, you've got to read this book, best book I have ever read. I saw the name, the author. I'd heard a little bit about him. He was a man that had grown up in the church. He had went to one of our universities that is associated with the Lord's Church. And he was at one time, at least at the beginning, a gospel preacher. I bought that first book. It's the only one I ever bought from him. He's actually sold more than 150 million copies of books. I mean, he is a mighty writer. When I read that first book, I saw how non-Christians would be attracted to it. It was very engaging, but it was missing something. It was missing the plan of salvation. Later on, later on, he would start teaching faith-only salvation. Later on, he would travel with people like Billy Graham who teach faith-only salvation. So I went to look at some of his sermons that you can look at online, and I looked at some of the lessons taught by Max Lucado. These 12 passages he uses to teach faith-only salvation. Let's today look at these 12 verses and let's have a proper understanding. To have a proper understanding of God's word, we're going to need to follow 10 rules. 10 rules to properly handle God's word. Because see, you can mishandle it. You can draw the wrong conclusions. Rule number one, and rule number one is very important. All Bible verses must agree. If we think there is some disagreement, the problem is not the Bible. The problem is you and me. We have not had a 
proper understanding and we are making a wrong conclusion because all the Bible perfectly agrees with itself. Number two, difficult verses. Are there difficult verses? Yes. Peter, in writing 2 Peter, says there's some verses by Paul that are a little difficult to understand. I will acknowledge there are some difficult verses in the Bible, especially the book of Revelation. Difficult verses are always interpreted via easier to understand verses. In other words, we let the Bible interpret itself. Number three, we need to note who is the speaker and who is the primary audience and who is the secondary audience. In most cases, the secondary audience is you and me. Rule number four, is it literal language or is it figurative language? Is it something to represent something? That especially applies to the book of Revelation. Number five, what type of literature is it? That will also affect our understanding. Number six, consider the overall context. Go back to where the paragraph begins and see what the writer is trying to talk about. Number seven, let's search for the plain and obvious meaning. God is not the author of confusion. His message is plain. It's obvious. We're the ones that sometimes make it a little bit too complicated. Number eight, what was the writer's intentions? What he write, what he wrote. Number nine, how about the original language? Will that help us by looking at the Hebrew, by looking at the Greek? Does that help us? Number 10, Look for the themes, the theological themes in the Bible, and always take a God-centered approach. So let's look at these 12 verses. The first one, Acts 10, 47. Peter, speaking to Cornelius and his family and those Jewish Christians that had traveled with him, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized? who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Okay, the word have has been added by the translators to make it a little bit more obvious. Now, here goes how the false teacher would use this passage. They would say, well, look right there. See, these people already were Christians just by having the Holy Spirit fall on them. Baptism is an afterthought for them. Is that what's happening here? Not exactly. Acts chapter 10 is a comparison to Acts chapter 2. Just like the Holy Spirit fell down on the apostles in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is doing something here. What is he doing? He's taking Peter and pushing Peter through the door. You know, Peter was a Jew. Peter was a Jew, and, and they had centuries upon centuries upon centuries of prejudice against the Gentiles. We are Jews. We are God's people. You're nothing. You see, a Jewish person would not associate with a Gentile. And here we have Peter. He's taken some Jewish Christians along with him as witnesses in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit kind of pushes Peter through the door. The Holy Spirit comes down upon Cornelius and his family, and Peter says, well, can anyone forbid water? The Holy Spirit is pushing us toward this conclusion that the gospel, that the gospel includes the Gentile nation as well. Remember that vision, that vision that Peter had received? of that great cloth, that great sheet coming down and, and that how God had made all of this. And don't call it unclean. It's God creation. So let's look at verse number two. Verse number two is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. False teachers will use this verse to teach faith only. Here's what it says. There is also an antitype. 
And that's a word that we don't use every day in our language. So let's first define what is an antitype. An antitype is a person or a thing that is foreshadowed or represented by a type of symbol. Let's go back to the verse. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. What's baptism? It's the antitype. He's making the comparison to what? Go back to the previous verse. Go back to get the context of what Peter is talking about here. He talked about how that Noah was saved through water by the building of the ark. And now we are saved through water, through our obedience to God's word. There's now an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's not like you're taking a Saturday bath, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. If you are trying to please God, have a good conscience, what are you going to do? You're going to fully obey you're going to believe, you're going to repent, you're going to confess, and you are going to be baptized. Just as Paul did and Tony did right there this past week when they became Christians, it's not the removal of the dirt on the skin. It's what? It's the obedience to God's Word. It's obedience to God's Word. Let's look at the next verse. That's Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Jesus is on the cross, and he speaks to one of the thieves on the cross next to him. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. False teachers will say, well, look right there. Look right there. That man was not baptized. And he was going to be with Jesus in paradise. You see, baptism is not required. Or at least that's what they say. Let me ask you a question. Is this verse happening during the Old Testament law period? Or is it happening during the New Testament law period? You see, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John take place, what? <laughs> they take place during the Old Testament time period. We don't have the New Testament time period until the end of Matthew. And we have the resurrection of Jesus. The church would start after the resurrection of Jesus. So, could Jesus, being God's son... Under the old law, could he say what he said to this thief? Yes, he's God's son. He has no need for baptism. Baptism would not start being valid until the church is established. By the way, we don't know too much about the background of this thief. And we really don't know a whole lot what he did other than the fact that he was a thief who turned and believed on Jesus during the Old Testament time period. Does this verse validate faith only? Well, only if you could go back to the Old Testament time period and Jesus could save you by saying these words to you. But see, we, we can't do that. We live under the New Testament time period. How about John 3? This is a common one. This is one they love. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The false teachers will say, look right there. You just believe you're going to have everlasting life. Is this what Jesus is saying right here to Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Let's go back and look at John chapter 3. Let's begin in verse number 14. And as Moses lifted up the servant, serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Speaking of his 
crucifixion, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about how that faith is that first step. Nicodemus, you've come to me. Will you believe in me? Nicodemus, do you have that much faith? that you would believe in me. You see, we're not going to be baptized unless we believe. We're not going to obey unless we believe. Is faith part of the equation? Well, yes, it is. But it's a faith that obeys. Let's look at Acts 16. This is one that false teachers love. Here is Paul and Silas. They're in jail. God has opened up the doors. The jailer is about to kill himself because he thinks all the prisoners have escaped. He doesn't want his family to suffer, so he's going to make it look like they killed him. Paul stops him from doing that. He comes in. He's trembling. He wants to know what must I do? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. False teachers will look at that and say, What's right there. Paul himself, the great apostle Paul said just to believe. Billy, we're going to take a trip. Let's pretend that the Yankees are playing the Rangers in Dallas, Okay. And I invite you to go along with me on the trip. And let's say that you ask me, you say, Michael, how many miles is it to Dallas? I don't know how many miles it is. Let's just pretend it's 250. I don't know, but let's just pretend it's 250 miles to Dallas. So I say to Billy, Billy, it's 250 miles to Dallas. We go down the road. I need to get some gasoline for my little red stupid car. We're traveling, uh, we're traveling with a, both gas efficient, okay? But it still needs a little gas. So I pull in to get gas, and Billy gets out to get a Coke and some snacks. He asks the person there inside, the attendant, how many miles is it to Dallas? Let's say it's 150. So it's 150 miles to Dallas. Later on, before we get into Dallas, I'm hungry, he's hungry, we pull in to eat. Billy once again asked the question, how far is it to Dallas? The waitress says it's 50 miles. Billy, we got a problem here. You've asked the same question three times, you've got three different answers. How far is it to Dallas? 250, 150, 50. Why the difference in the answers? Because it depends on where you are on the journey to Dallas. Where are you on your journey to salvation? Are you on step one? Got to believe. This man, he's on step one. He doesn't know what to believe. In fact, the very next verse tells us that Paul taught him, Paul and Silas taught him about Jesus you see, this man first needed to believe. He needed to believe before he could repent, before he could confess, and before he could be baptized. Now, he is baptized just after midnight. Let's continue. Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. False teachers will say, look right there. It's grace. It's faith. Baptism is not in the equation. Hold it right there. Are we saved by grace? Yes. 
None of us deserve God. I'm looking at some of the greatest, best people that I know right now, and none of you are good enough to be saved by just your good works. You're not good enough to make it to heaven as yourself, as a human being, because all human beings, we have sin in our lives. Romans 3, verse 23. When we reach the age of accountability, we have sin in our lives. So it's by grace. Each and every one of us is saved by the grace of God. And it's saved through faith. We believe in God's promises. We believe in God's assurances that if we truly obey, we will have salvation. In fact, John wrote in 1 John chapter 5 that these things are written that you may know that you have salvation, that you may know you have eternal life. It's not anything we've done. It's not any works we've done. It's a gift of God, but it's a faith. It's a faith that truly obeys. Let's talk more about that faith. Romans 3, 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. You can't do enough good to be saved. You can't keep the old law and be saved. You've got to obey God, and God has required salvation. Remember, rule number one, all Bible verses must agree. So, are we justified by faith? Yes. But is a, it is an obedient faith. It's a faith that obeys God. Let's talk more about faith. Romans 4, verse 5. But to him who does not work but believes on him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. When you obey God... When you put your faith in him, when you turn your life over to him, when you repent of your past, when you confess that Jesus is truly the son of God, you will then want to obey him fully. That's faith. That's real faith. Romans 5, therefore, having been justified by what? By faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, it has to be obedient faith. Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia, chapter 2, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, not by things we can do, not by keeping the old law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith. Faith. It's a faith that works. It's a faith that acts. If my doctor gives me a prescription and I believe in my doctor, I have faith in my doctor. We actually, at least and I, use Dr. Laura Lester as our physician. I believe in her. She's a smart doctor. She gives me a prescription. If I believe in her, what am I going to do? I'm going to take that prescription just like she told me to because I believe in her. Is your faith enough that would cause you to obey? Galatians 3, therefore the law, speaking of the Old Testament, was our tutor. It brought us to who? Christ. The Old Testament prophesied about Jesus. The Old Testament pointed to Jesus that we might be justified by faith. It's once again, obedient faith. Ephesians 1.13, in him you also trusted, you had faith, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When we obey, just like Tony, just like Paul last week, and we come up out of that water, that's obedience. That's obedience to God's word. You see, here's the problem. These false teachers, when they look at verses like we've looked at this morning, 
They overlooked something. Number one, they overlooked that every conversion story in Acts includes baptism. There is not one conversion story in the book of Acts that doesn't include baptism. Number two, if baptism is not essential, why the sense of urgency in the book of Acts? A man, high official, treasurer of a country, is willing to be baptized in what was probably dirty water by the side of the road. He'd rather be baptized now than wait days or weeks before he would eventually get home to clean water. A jailer, they've been up. It's past midnight. Everybody's tired. But they don't put baptism off. They are now baptized just after midnight. You know, it would be much easier. It'd be much easier to baptize about 3,000 people over several days. So why didn't Peter say, okay, folks, we got about 3,000 of you who want to be baptized. We'll do this group today, this group tomorrow, this group two days from now, this group three days from now, this group four days from now. Why are they all baptized that same day? By the way, we have run the numbers. It's possible to baptize 3,000 people in a few hours. It's a challenge, but you can do it. Why did they do that? Furthermore, Jesus himself set the example. He was baptized not for sin, but to fulfill all righteousness. He gives us the pattern. Furthermore, if baptism is not important, why are there so many baptism passages in the Bible? You see, baptism is important. Let's look at some of those baptism passages. Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For what reason? For the remission of sins. If you want to have your sins forgiven, you're going to need to be baptized. Acts 22, Ananias speaking to what was then Saul, we know him better as Paul. And now why are you waiting? It's been three days. You've been fasting. You have been repenting. You're sorry. You've been thinking. You've been putting your faith in God and the vision that he just gave you of Jesus. Ananias says, arise and be baptized. And do what? Wash away your sins. Hold it right here. This man still had sins. Saul still was a sinner. He had prayed. He had spent three days in prayer and fasting. He still had a sin problem. No sinner's prayer could wash away his sins. Only obedience to God's word could wash away those sins. Jesus himself, going back to that encounter with Nicodemus, told Nicodemus, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, foreshadowing the importance of baptism, in the new kingdom. In fact, Jesus, some of the last words he said to his apostles, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or how about Romans 6? Paul compares it to a burial. He says, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ?" were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried. You go down in the water. It's a burial. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That's where we come in contact with his life-giving blood. Through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even we also should walk in newness of life. 
Paul said in Galatians 3, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Why? Why? Because baptism is important. The false teachers, faith-only teachers will say, well, Peter said repent and be baptized in Acts 2. But Paul, at that time Saul, Paul told the jailer to believe. Paul told the jailer to believe. How do we respond? Go back to that trip for me and Billy. It's the same thing. The people in Acts chapter 2 already believe. They are already crying out, men and brethren, what shall we do? You are our Jewish brothers. What shall we do? We realize we have crucified the Messiah. We have killed him. What do we do? Peter said, repent. You see, you already believe. You repent and be baptized. Paul, talking to this jailer, you need to first take that first step. You need to believe. Will you believe in Jesus enough to obey him? There's a clear command. That clear command is to obey. Not partially, but fully. Fully obey the Lord. You see, baptism is not optional. It's not optional. It's, a, it's not a sign of an inward faith already saved you. Baptism is obedience. Who does the work in baptism? It's God. God is forgiving you. God is washing you clean. It's your obedience to his word. Baptism is not an afterthought. Look here. These are the words of Jesus. He said, first believe. Believe, John 8, 24. Then he said, repent. Luke 13, 3. He said then to confess, Matthew 10, 32. And then let's take it to the final step. You need to be baptized, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. As a Christian, you need to seek forgiveness. Isn't it wonderful that he will forgive? 1 John 1, 9. We'll have two elders down here waiting for you. Do you need to ask for prayers? We'd love to pray with you. James 5, 16. If there's anything that we can do to help you, I pray, I pray that you will respond while we stand and sing for your encouragement.